front. Mine. 1970 Pontiac Firebird, the car I've always wanted and now I have it. I rule. The weekly pseudo-academic pop culture analysis roundtable with drinking and swearing. My name is Christopher Maverick, but you can call me Mav. And I am once again here with my co-host, Wayne Wise. How's it going, Wayne? I'm good. How are you, Mav? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I'm doing, uh, like last week, I'm I'm watching politics and crying a lot while I try to <laughs> <laughs> write yeah. dissertation. And yeah. I, I, I tweeted something a moment ago, like half an hour ago. So, you know, several days ago when people listen to this, so you can go back and find it, find me saying it on Facebook or on Twitter. And I've been watching this thing where like a couple of days ago, Trump did a rally where he was complaining about Parasite winning Best Picture at the Academy Awards. And first off, I don't believe he's seen Parasite. He, I mean, he said, I didn't like that movie. <laughs> and, and he, it, it has, it's two hours, 12 minutes long. It's got subtitles. He didn't fucking sit through that movie. He, he just yeah. didn't, you know, yeah. but that said, I don't mind him not liking Parasite. I, I really don't. It's, it's, yeah. it's a movie with a lot of, you know, it, it basically the message of the movie is kind of that rich people suck. So he wouldn't have liked it. I, I get it. <laughs> you know, I get that he wouldn't have liked it. And it's fine. But then he went on to like rant about like, you know, what, you know, why can't we go back to the good old days where, where movies like Gone with the Wind won Best Picture? And here's my problem. Motherfucker didn't see Gone with the Wind. <laughs> I love, like, I understand, like, I'm sure someone said, say Gone with the Wind. It's a racist dog whistle and people will be like, you know, deliver Girls will get out of you know. They'll get, they'll, you know, I'm sure someone told him to say it for that reason. Mm-hmm. But like, I like acknowledging the problematic aspects of Gone with the Wind. I like it better than most people. Mm-hmm. But it's four fucking hours long without right. commercials. It came out seven years before he was born. He has never fucking watched Gone with the Wind. Does, <laughs> there's does, no does, way does not, have, does not have that attention span. No, there's no way he sat through Gone with the Wind. It's just, <laughs> just like just like no, no. I mean, say Star Wars. You know. <laughs> like I, I believe, I believe you watch Star Wars, okay? <laughs> like like you know, at some point, but he didn't go back and watch he, he, Gone with he, the Wind. He just right, didn't. Rooting for the Empire, I'm sure. Right, right. Yeah, you know, and, and fine. You know, like be evil, but don't don't insult my intelligence. It's a it's a movie. I care about this stuff. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> that's not what we're talking about today. It's just something no, I wanted to get not. off my chest. <laughs> um, what are we talking about today? Um, I don't know. No, actually, <laughs> uh, I, I read an article a while back. We've been talking about doing this this episode for a while now. And I just stumbled across an article online like you do mm-hmm. that just made me start thinking about things. It's the article is called Millennials Fueling the Experience Economy. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> Speaking of dog whistles, they use the word millennials. Yeah, yeah. Don't tune uh, out. Like, yeah. we, we trust us. This gets better. Yeah, we we're we're not going to sit here and bitch about millennials. With that, that's not our thing. I I okay, boomer. I, <laughs> that's a whole different conversation. Um, yes. I'm I'm the vanguard of Gen X, uh, <laughs> but um, it's basically the idea of it is that using data from millennials. This this article went on and looked at just people in general. And the idea, basically the, what I was looking at is the idea that we are moving past a consumer culture into an experience culture. The idea that people are paying, would rather pay to have experiences of things rather than buy things. Uh, and this is being led by, by millennials who don't have money for either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but it's branching out into other generations as well. Um, and I, I, I find that kind of fascinating. I, I guess I just, I want to talk about is this a thing? Is this happening? What are our experiences with it? Do we see this happening? What are some reasons behind it? Uh, is this the beginning of the end of, of capitalist society? Uh, or, sure, you know, what, sure what, it is. What does this say about late stage capitalism? Uh, Mike Bloomberg last night said, yeah, we're not going to eliminate capitalism. It's been tried before and it failed. And there's some truth to that. Um, yeah, fuck him too. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, I just, I, I thought that this is right for at least an hour's worth of us going back and forth between ourselves and our our lovely guest. 
Sounds good. So let's introduce the lovely guests. Um, we have <laughs> like that segue. Can, yeah, I like that. It was very good. It was, you know, just you know, feel free to, to if you if my voice sounds weird today, I am coming down with a cold. So feel free to carry me throughout the episode. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, so guest number one returning to the show, our old friend Maron Langsner. Hey, Maron. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Hey, hey And you, you are also not a millennial. <laughs> no, I'm also a Gen Xer, but I have special interests in economics and finance and i lead a double life in or a triple life in the arts tech and real estate mm-hmm. and working in real estate i did kind of a deep dive into economics and finance and i see a lot of millennials make choices about where they live mm-hmm. which is an experience that's very material so i, I think that i think that's gonna that's going to be very relevant, especially the real estate part. I'm looking yeah, looking forward yeah. to seeing how this goes. And um, you brought a guest for us this time, somebody I've not met yet. So this is, I'm going to try this. Ayo Osubamiro. That was really good. That was, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I like, let, let's just pretend that that was perfect. Now, how does it, how is it really pronounced? Is that right? Yeah. Osubamiro. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, welcome. <laughs> welcome to Vox Podcast. Thank you. Tell us about yourself. I'm actually a millennial, so I feel very tied to this topic. <laughs> uh, um, so currently, um, clawing my way through journalism, uh, and uh, sexually how I met Maron was that in a podcasting class. So that's a little bit about We're me. We're in a podcasting fellowship. Yeah, Let's make sorry. it sound better. I, yeah. I like how you guys are all prof- all professional and sounding, and you know we're a couple of idiots who like. Oh, you want to start a podcast? Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> what is the fellowship? You guys? I mean, I know, but like, what is it? What is the fellowship for for the listeners? I you want to do this one or should I? Oh sure. Okay. Hey, so it is a fellowship through Stony Brook University, and each student has to incubate a podcast from start to finish. So it's uh, we conceptualize it. We're learning everything from like making it sound great to how to sell it, how to not get sued, all that good stuff. <laughs> so hopefully you'll be better than us one day. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. We so, stand on your shoulders. Ooh. <laughs> Wait a minute. Like, so if you're, if you're standing on somebody's shoulder and you're like crossing the, I don't think I want to be on the bottom. <laughs> That's, that sounds like it's actually a bad idea. I mean, I know it's a compliment, but when you think about that saying standing on your shoulders, it's like, eh, wait, I, anyway. <laughs> so I, I guess I don't think it's, uh, we, I mean, we'll link the article in the show notes that Wayne was yeah. talking about, but I don't know that it's, um, uh, as we said at the beginning of the, of, of the show, it's sort of, it's sort of, sort of buzzwords itself off yeah. by talking about millennials are doing this, you know, you, you know, them damn kids yeah, you, and their avocado toast what, and all that. You yeah. won't believe number six. Right, right. And it's not that at all. It, it's no. not, their point is really, we and they have reached, charts and graphs actually. Yeah, yeah. And we've reached a point in our culture and our economy mixing together where they are arguing it's still a capitalist society they're saying but we're seeing an upswing of spending our capital on experiences that are um, temporally based that are in the moment you pay to do something and pay to live a certain thing to live an experience that is intangible that you you know sort of mentally and emotionally keep with you as opposed to buying some stuff that is mm-hmm. would you say that's more or less the, the yeah. argument that's being made pretty much mm-hmm. and it's not like people have never taken vacation before you know it just it, it's not this is a brand new oh my god what's this it's just that this is the trend and i don't know i mean i i, I see where they're coming from and i as a, you know as we said at the top of the show i am not a millennial i am a gen xer that said i i, I see it both ways i do like vacations there's a lot of stuff that i like mm-hmm. to do i like to do really crazy things just because you know it's interesting i mean we we've mentioned on the show before that like i decided to become a professional wrestler at one point just because i was like this sounds interesting let me pay some money to be trained to be a professional wrestler it's a skill that you know if i wrestle one time and learn something that's interesting and i did it Mm -hmm. for like for like nine years um i like going on vacations i like going to the beach i like going camping um i like whitewater rafting and kayaking there are lots of you know fun things that i like to do um I, I like to pay to, you know, like I go to Vegas um, relatively re- 
frequently to, you know, because I like gambling, but I also just like the city of Las Vegas. So I, mm-hmm. I like hanging out there. So I understand that. On the other hand, I also like stuff a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I buy a lot of stuff. <laughs> I, you know, I, I've seen myself moving away from the stuff. Uh, some of that is finances. Some of that is space. Some of that is, you know, I moved 10 years ago and was like, fuck, I got a lot of CDs. Um, and you know, in that space, and I, I think there's some things changing. I, with my own experience with this, using the the CDs as a, an example, um, yeah, I music is my other hobby. You know, comics, books, music, and I, I bought a lot of CDs. And 25 years ago, I was buying CDs that if I ever want to listen to this again, I must own this. Um, and there are some of them I haven't listened to in 20 years, but it's still here if I want to hear this. But now I also have Spotify and Amazon Music and YouTube. Right. And so if you want to listen to it, you ask your phone, like by yeah, voice, right. and it just happens. Right. You know, it's, so that need to own something has changed for me over the last 20 years or so. I, I don't have to have a physical copy of the CD. You know, I, I rent it on Spotify or, or whatever. Uh, so it, it has changed that. You know, I'm essentially renting access to something as opposed to physically keeping it. Um, so just that whole concept of owning something has, has changed because of services like Spotify. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that, I mean, that was true of books, you know, as, as long as there have been libraries, the idea that I don't have to own this, I can borrow this for three weeks and read it. It doesn't have to take up room in my house, mm-hmm. but somehow digital technology, I think has changed our relationship to stuff in general, uh, at least in those categories. Uh, it, it's mm-hmm. hard. It's hard to rent a digital car and drive to Vegas. <laughs> But even with digital products, we still need stuff to access it. Like yes, today right, this, right. Today yeah. on the subway, I got a new Kindle a few months ago, and my Kindle completely froze up, and mm-hmm. I couldn't access my basically thousand books that were on there. So yeah. I do have this abstract of thousand of, of a thousand books on there, but my you know couple hundred dollar device that was fairly new, that's the latest model. Right, was a piece of plastic today, mm-hmm. and and that's a good and point. You're right; it's it's still consumer. We have to consume the thing that gives us access. Mm-hmm. I, you're so as you said, you're a millennial, so you're slightly younger. And I think Wayne's I think Wayne's thing with music that's that is a I don't know why it's the obvious touchstone because you know the same is true of books as Marone just pointed out. The same is true of comics. It's true of movies, but music is the one thing where I think at least to my experience, the idea of the cloud and the internet, it has killed CDs. It's killed. I mean, yes, I get that vinyl has like a a small resurgence, but that's a novelty, right? People buy vinyl because it's cool. And compared to vinyl in 1979, it's nothing, you know? Right, right. So like, if you want to, if you want to listen to the new Taylor Swift album or, or whatever, right. Or, or, or the old Beatles album, right. Or anything in between, the default way to listen to it right now is to pull it up on your cloud or your home pod or your, you know, or your computer or, or iPod or whatever. Like that's how to do it. But you, you are probably young enough to where that's not as much of a major shift. Yeah. I mean, I like when I was growing up, CDs were like at the very tail end. Like I, I, I think I've only bought like one CD in my life and that's wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, was, I, that wasn't that wasn't a joke i mean just I, like, the I, idea I, of that I, is just I'm, like wow I'm, I'm going to go over here and weep near my cd collection <laughs> i i i know we went to the apocalypse of music but it's kind of sad um but like there's this interesting i think there's this interesting thing we, we talked you touched on it like the idea of owning something now has more status elements um like the idea of owning a vinyl confers some sort of status because you have to go out and buy it and it's expensive, more expensive than uh, I'm assuming a regular CD would be. Yeah. Um, and then you also have to have like a, a, a really fancy, you know, vinyl player, which is a couple hundred dollars. So the, the act of owning things becomes more mm-hmm. status based. And there's sort of, I think there's a really interesting correlation between this shift and like the rise of Instagram, because the idea mm-hmm. of being all these experiences are things you put on your Instagram. And like, yeah. even when people buy things, it's things they'll like lay out really pretty and take a really pretty picture of and then put on mm-hmm. Instagram. Yeah. So there's this sort of, 
sense that like you're only in because we're living these sort of constructed lives the only way to do that is to be buying into these experiences that are unique you know you can buy a song for 2.99 but like being front stage next to taylor swift is Mm -hmm. something that's uh differentiates yourself and so and it's an experience that you know only like a couple people can have there's a scarcity element Something that that just came to mind. I I don't want to just make this whole conversation about the music thing, but just since we're there, as someone who has done this, you know, like I went through vinyl, I went through CDs, and now MP3s and and the digital track. and and streaming. <laughs> I yeah, I had friends who had eight tracks. I I never really. I had older friends who had eight tracks. Um, Cassettes certainly in the the eighties, mm-hmm. um, but th- there was something that there was more than just owning the CD or owning the album. I as I was a collector of that stuff, you know, I was a hobbyist. Going to a record store was as much about the experience of going there as it was coming home with the record. Mm-hmm. So in that way, I was yes, I was buying the thing to take home to listen to for the rest of my life. But I was also participating in an act of culture where I was having the experience where you would go to the record store or the user record store with your friends and you would talk about this stuff and like, oh, hey, look what I found. And so it wasn't a completely there was an experience aspect of of that consumerism, I guess, which I hadn't thought of till right now as we were discussing this. So, well, I actually had the same thought from from what I was saying, because it's not I mean, I think that's always been true. It, you know, I'm thinking on several levels. You know, Wayne, you and I have talked before that there is I mean, I live in the year 2020. I have the Marvel Universe app the DC universe app and the comicology app all on my iPad sitting right next to me. I never have to physically buy a comic book ever mm-hmm. again. Like, yeah. That's not why I go to a comic book store. It is, there is an aspect of a going to, well, there's an aspect of just sort of liking to own the physical thing. Like somehow the, uh, for many, many reasons, this isn't a comic book conversation, but for many, many reasons, it feels different to read a paper comic book than it does to read a digital comic book yeah. or a paper book than a, mm-hmm. than a digital book. And I'm not, I'm not one of those people who are ever going to say, you know, you, you have people who will go like, well, you know, with the vinyl, you get the experience and you can, you can really hear the soul of the music. And yeah, no, I'm not doing any of that bullshit. I'm saying like, there is it I, like the actual tactile feel. I enjoy flipping pages more than I enjoy sliding my finger it, it, across things. It, it changes my interaction with the text. Right. The, 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 so the there's delivery that. Format. Right. There's that. But there's also, you know, the act of hanging out in a comic book shop or a bookstore. I've literally in my life gone on dates to bookstores, right? Like that is yeah. a, a thing that I've done. Like if I'm, cause I'm a nerd and if I'm dating another nerd, I might be like, Hey, you want to go and hang out at the bookstore and, you know, read because, yeah. you know, look, I, look I, trust me, I've had sex before, but, <laughs> but, it's, but, it's, no, but it's, that, it's a thing that I've done. Right. And, mm-hmm. and like, even with something that I can't just replace digitally, like buying clothes, I have to physically buy clothes. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I could buy them on Amazon and I have, I've bought them on Amazon. I've bought them on. There's a lot of clothing places that I buy online from, you know, just individual shops to big, big stores. But I like the idea of going out to a store and trying things on or, you know, I'm a big shopper. I like going, uh, going shopping with my friends and just like, let's go play dress up because there is something about that experience. So that Mm -hmm. was always part of it, too. I think it's interesting because the like the sell of like digital like apps and stuff is like that experience is so full of friction that um like the convenience factor will outweigh the like the fun of like going to a store and like digging like there's this interesting there's always the argument that millennials are used to instant gratification and so that's the reason Mm -hmm. why we're uh uninterested in like going to malls and like you know because if you go to a mall they might not have your size and if you go to a bookstore they they, might have to order it for you you know there's a sense Mm -hmm. that like you in those experiences you have to come up with a lot more friction than in other ways Whereas Mm -hmm. like when you're spending money on, you know, when you're spending money on a vacation, there's not, you know, you're living a fantasy, you know, there's not the friction of like, oh, is this Mm -hmm. vacation going to be out of stock? Is this like, you know, you will get the instant gratification of being able to book it. It's just a matter of being able to afford it, which is an entirely different thing. Right. Well, this can't afford anything. We're fucking broke. But like the idea is like if we're, if life is so hard and we're, you know, living in the end times of capitalism and all that things, you might as well like enjoy we're not. it. I would love it if we were living in the end time of capitalism. We're not living in the end times no, of capitalism. I, no. I like, like just like, the people who whine about that is just, first off, 
if we were living in the end times of capitalism, great, because it kind of sucks not being able to afford stuff. But but we're not. Capitalism's doing fine. You know, <laughs> it's going to continue like there's nothing to worry about. I, I don't care if Bernie Sanders gets elected king of the universe tomorrow. Capitalism's going to continue. OK, yeah. you can't yeah. stop it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> like, like, you know, I, I wish he could because I am obviously far, you know, I'm, I'm a nihilist. I'm far more left wing than he is, but it's not going to happen. Not in my lifetime. So fine. But that, that said, like you, I, I do think that there is, you know, the idea of vacations. I think you're right. It is a, it is a material, the idea of a vacation, even though we think of it as an experience, it is still a materialistic status capitalist uh, capitalist thing that you're doing you are you know it is pure consumerism right you are no matter where you go you are taking money that you have earned through marxist society and i'm using marxist the correct way not in the way that people on the internet use i'm saying i am part of the proletariat i have worked my ass off i have scrimped and saved a little bit of money and now i am pouring that capital back into the into the system to afford to fly to vegas and blow the rest of my money or to afford to, you know, just drive out into the woods and pitch a tent and like spend money to pretend that I lived 200 years ago. Right. Like that is a, that is a thing that I'm doing because that's fun. But even in doing that, like I, I think the first time I went camping, I was probably seven years old. So that would be 1981. And I still took a shit ton of pictures. Right. Like that was <laughs> like, like that was going out there and being in the woods and taking pictures because even though it was an experience, there was always a material aspect. I want to have something that I can show people later and say. Material aspect or a social aspect? Both. Both. It's because it's because it's there's a social aspect of me being able to show off. Ha ha. I got to go camping. Ha ha. I got to go to Vegas. Ha ha. I got to go to, you know, the the Prince concert or wherever. Or Prince is dead. Long long live Prince. Um, But I got to go wherever. Um, So there's a social aspect of that. Like, you know, uh, I've I've increased my social capital by just sort of sharing that experience. But Mm -hmm. also. I just like having, you know, like I like having pictures, even if they're virtual ones on Instagram, but I like having reminders of, Hey, you remember when I did that thing? That was fun. Like I haven't, I haven't, I, I'm a retired pro wrestler, but it's neat to go and look through pictures every once in a while. Or when, you know, when I meet somebody say, look, see, here's me getting beat up by somebody, you know, (laughs) like like that, like that's a, you know, that, that is entertaining in a way Like you know, you meet somebody like the excitement of meeting a celebrity isn't really the picture, right? Like if you're, if you're a big fan of, uh, um, it's it's to prove that you've met them. (laughs) Right. Or even so last week's show, um, I, I mentioned my crush on Danica McKellar, right? Yeah. And, and you, you, I'm glad you're bringing this up because yeah. you have to, this has to be a follow up. Yeah. It's, I mentioned my crush on Danica McKellar. She saw the tweet and liked the tweet and Whoa. the, and the 13 year old boy in me had a spontaneous orgasm immediately. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like, Oh my God. And I screenshotted the tweet and showed <laughs> everyone that I knew <laughs> because <laughs> that was, but, but see, that is turning, I mean, really, I, I I didn't do it to get a screenshot from her. I right. did it because like it was neat. I was excited that, you know, this this celebrity that I you know, I've never even met her, but the celebrity that I liked when I was a child, um, you know, like acknowledged me for two seconds of her life. So that was cool for me. And that was the experience. But now I've got this image that like it's just kind of cool to look at. It's a thing. It's a memento. Mm-hmm. If I go, you know, when I go on trips, sometimes I'll buy a T-shirt somewhere, you know, because I want to have a reminder, a physical reminder that I can go back in later and say, oh, yeah, I was at Myrtle Beach that one time, <laughs> you know, like that. that's a thing, right? It's funny. I'm trying to think. I actually really don't buy souvenirs as much anymore. Like now that I think about it, like I, yeah. I, yeah, I don't, don't as much as I did. Like when I was a kid, I, I like collect, I collected snow globes from wherever I went. But like gen- generally speaking, you know, if I'm going somewhere like last time, I, last trip I took, like I blew my like savings to go to Paris and then we went to like Afropon and that was like the highlight of my life so far, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't <laughs> I have think- anything from that trip. Yeah, for, for me, having the the photos, I mean, I have the photos instead of souvenirs. 
Mm-hmm. And things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that's me. I don't think it has to be buying something. I think that, like, like it, it's always weird to me when there's this new thing that, like, a lot of musicians do it, a lot of celebrities, um, comedians do it. Hey, you know, I have a no iPhone policy at my concert because mm-hmm. you know you should be enjoying the experience of being here and not looking at it through your phone. And okay, I see your point. Fuck you. Your tickets cost a hundred dollars. I want to remember this. I want to be yeah, able to yeah. remember I this want later. Some pictures. That's it. And that's and 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 it's not like they're like, oh, this is the new millennial culture. And it's like, no, you are being an old man yelling in a cloud because long before I had an iPhone, I had a Polaroid camera. You know, mm-hmm. like that was that's a thing that people do yeah, when man. they go places because yeah. I because I like you and I yeah. want to be able to point at this experience again later. I and things I, I remember venues uh, for for concerts where they just you they they would take recording devices from you they would take cameras from you um, you know, just that was that was pretty standard mm-hmm. uh, I I've had a friend you kicked out of the nine thirty club in D C because he had a camera with him yeah and that's stupid I mean I understand <laughs> like it's not it, it, it and, and now really, you, they, they you can't are, do that now at all you know right and if you are a performer and you're being affected by like yes I understand if there's if there's a multitude of flat bulbs okay maybe but seriously if you're distracted by people holding their iphone up in the crowd then you're a shitty performer <laughs> I also think the rules have been relaxed around these things too because it used mm-hmm. to be yeah. when 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 the smartphone became ubiquitous mm-hmm. it became something right. that you couldn't take away from people because there was a while in college yes where i was a house manager at a theater at a big theater center and we had to ask people to hand in phones and pagers. And if someone Mm -hmm. was a physician who was on call, we knew their seat. And if their phone or pager went off, we would go and find them. Now, this Mm -hmm. was the mid 90s. So having a cell phone or or a pager was a status symbol. But I Mm -hmm. think I want to go back to the the consumption. Now it means you're 12. Now now it means like you've come of age. Here's your device. And I think we need to stop calling them phones and start calling them something else. (laughs) <laughs> I will say though, the theater is the last place where you can't have your phone out. Like I have never yes. seen theater performance where it's appropriate. So I think yeah. there's there's an interesting thing there where it's like the it, it like like you know like when Hamilton was big, it was a huge status to go, but people only have pictures from outside, you know. Right. You but in th- in that case, I think that there with like Hamilton. I think they're protecting their product, right? They don't want you yeah. to record it because, you know, they sell the experience of going to it. Well, that's different than a bootleg concert by quite a bit, though. How so? Well, so a bootleg concert, like you sell bootlegs of this. And this was something that if we want to go back to music, Metallica used to encourage recording at their shows. And that's part of how they got big. But when mm-hmm. you go to a theater, the etiquette of theater forever, and this is partially because of unions. And this is for many reasons is that like, since basically Wagner, Wagner was the one who created the code of conduct for audience members that we're still with, where you sit down in the dark and you consume and you're not part of the show. Whereas right. in, at a concert, you're part of the show and you're there for the crowd and theater. You're, there's very strict rules about who can take photos and when and union and flash mm-hmm. would really mess with that. But the the fact that theater still has some of his rich, some of its ritual roots at work, because you mm-hmm. don't necessarily see too many people pulling their phones out at religious observances. You know, and I think there's still some of that. But something I, I'd like to go back to in terms mm-hmm. of the material versus experiential is how much of the economics of it. And if we're going to say, okay, like, let's talk about economics and economics is the study of the distribution of finite resources and the resources we're talking about are time and money. And if we're talking about music, there's a very big difference between do you have the $300 Bose headset or the $100, $129 Apple ear pods or the $20 or $10 wired speakers. And what are you listening Mm -hmm. to your music on? Because that's, that's a bigger issue or a bigger piece of status than, you know, the songs that cost 99 cents, a dollar 99 for something really popular, your Spotify subscription, you still have this material aspect and you still have, well, I don't believe in 
I don't believe in material goods. I believe in experiences and I'm experiencing this music on this $500 headset. What are you actually saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, but like to go to your point about theater, I think it's interesting though. Like if you think of like, especially now how elaborate concerts are, like, like just look at like Beyonce's performances. Mm-hmm. Like those are theater. Those are like, I mean, those are incredibly elaborate. Yes. Uh, well thought out. For it. So like, why aren't those subject to this whole like moratorium on phones like it's interesting to me that like that's been able to hold really firm in like theater you know uh but arguably these big you know stadium tours that we're seeing so much of now those those are kind of similar no like you don't think there's like i I think there is a slight difference though in what the experience is so here's what i'm thinking about is just while marone was talking about like you know wagnerine theater um this is not universal because there are exceptions, but in the, in the reference model, you know, in general, if you're at a play, the world of the play does not include you as an audience member, right? Like now there are, obviously there are plays that where it does, where, you know, there is direct crowd interaction where Mm -hmm. the fourth wall is broken. Right. But the digesis of your standard performance is the audience is the people on, on stage can't see you. They react as not to your presence. The digesis of a standard concert performance is they are very much react. Like Beyonce is singing to you. If you go see, if you go see, I don't know, death of a salesman they're performing it and you happen to be you know peering in from the darkness but you don't exist right you don't exist in that world obviously there are there are lots of plays where that's not true but like the standard is such that you're not part of the world whereas the standard at a at a concert or a comedy show is you are a part of the world right like it like you are expected it's expected that you know if the crowd boos, the performer will change, you know, or will, will, and if the crowd cheers, the performer will react to it. That's sort of the expectation in that kind of event. On the other hand, it's the it's sports, same thing, right? The, you know, they, they're not directly interacting with you at a football game, but they are very much aware of your presence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to make true. you tell people what digesis is because not everybody's <laughs> in grad school right now. And uh, digesis is listeners. <laughs> digesis is the world of is the world of the play, right? Like if you're in a if you're in a play or if you're in a movie, right? Like uh, so that's that's the easiest way I can explain it. This is the way I usually explain it to my students. Um, if um if I'm watching a movie, there are two kinds of of uh, of music. There's diegetic music and non diegetic music. Diegetic music. <laughs> is I'm watching Say Anything and John Cusack holds up the boom box and In Your Eyes plays because that's the, mu- that's the music on the boom box and he can hear it. The girl can hear it. Everybody who drives by can hear it. That is part of the scene. It is in their world. Non-diegetic music is music that I hear Soundtrack. as an audience member for, for effect, but it's not a part of their world. So in a play, typically the people on stage can't see me or they're supposed to pretend that they can't see me. Um, another example is like a, you know, a soliloquy or an aside in a play. If, um, if somebody pauses and says something out loud and we, we understand that the other characters can't hear it, even though they're shouting it. So the people in the cheap seats can hear it. You understand that they're really just thinking that, you know, so that's, that is a non diegetic moment is not in the world. Like how you chose a really Gen X <laughs> like say anything. <laughs> John Cusack is dreamy and we should have mentioned him last week on the crush episode because, Oh my God, I have a crush on John. Cusack. True story. He followed my girlfriend on Twitter for several months. Oh, she's so lucky. Why is she with you? <laughs> a question that I like, people, your, girl, I like your girlfriend a lot, but the, but if she's got a shot, she's chosen wrong. Because Maron went out with his boombox and held it up under her window. <laughs> but like she, the people ask her that every day, but um, <laughs> the New York Times actually interviewed her in a story about people who had famous Twitter followers, and it, it was oh, like cool. a really funny a really funny thing about like, you know, what, what happens when celebrities start following normal people and does it affect their lives? So, <laughs> it, it, but yeah, John Cusack was briefly a part of her Twitter sphere. <laughs> happened. Like he just angrily left her one day. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's not my story to tell, but there's a New York times story that I think she disagreed with him about something politically and he just blocked her. 
<laughs> and then yeah, so like John Cusack, great. like in this day and age, is a really aggressive political tweeter. Mm-hmm. And I think that they had an exchange and he started following her and they were having like a few Twitter exchanges here and there. And then she said something that he disagreed with politically and he just like blocked her out of nowhere. And she was like, oh, so John Cusack blocked me. And I was like, well... Uh, things happen well, it but, could have been yeah but, oh, well. <laughs> but, well, but I mean I think that actually ties back into it because that that again that's part of this whole experience culture where where I'm wondering if a big part of it isn't you know we talked briefly about things that are at the, where we talked at the beginning about things like the iPod or you know the, the cloud and you know the Kindle changing the way but maybe it's a technology thing maybe it's not a millennial thing it's just you know the it's idea a- that she has any relationship with John Cusack at all positive or negative doesn't happen 10 years ago right like like, it's not like she just ran into him it's just that we live in a world where you can share an experience with a celebrity danica mckellar can notice if i talk about her there's still (laughs) material things around experience i think what we should start talking about is what's ephemeral and what's not so Mm -hmm. like certain experiences are incredibly expensive a dinner at peter luger's steakhouse for two people conservatively if you're behaving yourselves but you're like still having the experience a dinner for two is 250 dollars in cash Mm -hmm. and that is definitely an experience there's not a lot like it out there and it's iconic and it's been iconic for decades and Mm -hmm. it's been a rich person thing or it's been a an ex- it, it's an occasion meal and you sure. could have bragged about it long before this experience culture was there but the difference mm-hmm. today is that people put it on their instagram and there's been mm-hmm. articles about people about food and restaurants and service and restaurants being slowed because people stop and take pictures of their food and post it mm-hmm. and what's that's that my brother too? my brother to post a picture of uh, my, my brother probably post a picture of just about everything he ever eats or drinks whether he buys it at a restaurant or cooks it himself it's just the thing he does yeah but <laughs> how much of that is about self-documentation and years ago when that wasn't an option were people doing it less? Were people having fewer of those experiences or were they just not necessarily as public about it or were, was it cheaper? Cause if you're talking about music, music used to take up a lot of space. And I think one of the differences too, mm. with you and Wayne versus me and Io, me and I, Io and I live in New York city where space is at a very big premium. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. incredibly expensive. And you guys live in Pittsburgh where you can have the equivalent of a 20 family apartment building for five cents. <laughs> <laughs> At least a dime. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a nice neighborhood. But just cost of living and cost of space and population density. Because if, if, if we have people who are living in cities where the price of an apartment, the price of a small apartment in New York City is the price of a gigantic house out of New York City. That person who's living in New York City for the experience of New York City. Yes. Yeah. And that's what I was going to get to. That, yeah. That's my pushback because I would argue that this was always true because since New York, since New York City became a thing, I mean, I don't, it wasn't true in 1805, but since New York City became the cultural center of the world, the thing that you're paying for when you buy, when you buy your little 10 by 10 apartment in New York City for a thousand, for a million dollars, right? Like that is, that is a, that is, a, you know, that you're, you're not paying for the physical space. You're not paying for, the craftsmanship like I like my house and the cost of my house was mostly how big my house is right um the location matters but not but like it's really the price you know what what I'm paying for is the scarcity of housing and the building experience what you're paying for when you live in Manhattan is you're paying to live in Manhattan, right? Like you, like if you wanted to, you could live in Jersey and commute, but then you'd be a commoner, you know, <laughs> you know, like, 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 like that's, I mean, but people do that, right? Like you are, you are literally paying extra money for proximity to experiences. And Aya, what do you think? Cause I, I don't know where you were. I, I forget where you were before New York, but you've chosen to stay. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in Michigan, so I'm, I'm well aware that I'm, I, I'm insane and, I, and, I, <laughs> and I've made a really poor decision money wise, but I, you know, I think, um, 
Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, that is the whole point of New York is uh, experience driven. I mean, why else would you be paying like 50 bucks for a strawberry? You know, like there, there's just like <laughs> there's just that uh, you're so close to so many different things. Uh, that That's the draw. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, there's it's interesting because like I, I wish I had a good source of sight, but there, there's there's been a movement towards urbanization amongst college educated um, professional like millennials like just generally yes. we are crowding in cities more and like I mean there's factors like job you know factors industries like the biggest growth industries like tech industries are they're all based in major cities uh, for whatever reason so there's a sense that like if you want to be you know the future economy or in the next thing you have to be in a city so there is some like I think there's social imperatives to be in cities as well but like on the other hand the idea is like you get to be close to everything that's interesting and I think it'll be interesting to see is like if you know as millennials you know millennials now like I'm at technically at the tail end they're starting to like grow up and have children and like buy houses and stuff um Mm -hmm. and so the there's also a sense of like you know once they get out of their 20s and like early 30s are these experiences going to continue to be things that's important is this part of youth culture generally or well what's the experience of having children and what's the experience of getting married and moving away because that will definitely affect the economics of choice. Because I can tell you mm-hmm. that with the tech companies, as far as I can tell, they have to be in cities because the talent that they want to attract wants to be in cities. And that's why we have all of the major companies buying up space in Hudson Yards in New York City. In terms mm-hmm. of the experience of where people live, what I, the way I break it down is the variables in in terms of picking a home, and this is sales or rentals, are location, size, amenities, and price. And for most people, price is a fixed variable. Price is Mm -hmm. what you can afford to pay, and most people will max that out because they're going to live in the nicest thing that fits their price. Now, that means that you're going to compromise on location, size, amenities. And Mav, I'm going to disagree with you about what you're paying for in New York, because there's some stuff in New York where you're effectively living in a five-star hotel. There's buildings I oh, work sure, in. Sure. I, I, I use the phrase, and now we're going to see the other swimming pool. That oh, yeah, is the yeah, thing I, don't I mean... say at my job. Yeah. And those apartments, the, the doorman looks like the captain of the love boat. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I, I don't disagree with that. I'm just saying that the, I'm saying that that uh, that apartment or that, that apartment with two pools in New York City cost, you know, a hundred times what that apartment with two pools cost in Pittsburgh and a thousand times what that apartment with two pools cost in Des Moines. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's the same thing when you yeah. start moving around. So, yeah, you have, you have the, it's like some of the worst apartments I've ever seen. Places that you would put your worst enemy in for a year for them to think about what they've done have been <laughs> in the nicest neighborhoods, in the most oh, popular sure. neighborhoods where there's sure. there's a genre of apartment that I refer to as the mm-hmm. poet's apartment. Mm-hmm. And the poet's apartment, you find a lot of them in the West Village, you find a lot of them in Chelsea, and they're mm-hmm. tiny and they're expensive and mm-hmm. they come with their own cardio because they're on the sixth floor because that's <laughs> the highest you could legally have a walk up. And that shit rents because someone really thinks that their soul belongs in the West Village. That mm-hmm. same price of that West Village apartment in a less popular neighborhood will get you a ridiculous building. And there's mm-hmm. people who will not leave certain neighborhoods or there or people will be saying, depending on where their values are, because some people really value the apartment. And some people really value the location. Some people mm-hmm. will put like, they, I, I have conversations with clients where they will tell me that the only purpose of their apartment is where they store their sleeping body and shower in between adventures. And Mm -hmm. that's a perfectly valid way to experience New York. Yeah. And they're, but they're optimizing, they're optimizing their experience then, right? Like they're, like you said, they're storing, it's where they're sleeping. So they're trying to be as close to the adventure as possible because what they're really doing is buying, they're buying convenient access to the, like, like my home in Pittsburgh, I am buying, I lived it. I lived in a neighborhood that was big enough for a large house that I wanted. And, you know, I have a pool, I have my own pool. I have a hot tub. I, you know, I, I have a wait. Actually, 
Yeah, I've had. You've been to my house. I, mean, I was in your <laughs> house when you had a hot tub. When did and that happen? It. Like literally, I installed it within six months. Wayne, what? Six yeah, months you, after I bought the house, I've literally always had it. Wow. <laughs> You've been to my home. Yeah, yeah. but anyway, um, yeah. So like for the house. Yeah. So, but I mean, but I also. I can't just pop over and see Hamilton whenever I want. And in fact, when Hamilton was here, there was like a lottery and, you know, you had to shiv somebody and there was like, all right. it was very dangerous to see Hamilton and I didn't get to go, you know, yeah. so like that. that's still so, the case but in I mean, New York for the record. That's okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, but like there, you know, but that said, um, even in, you know, even it's a, it's a matter of scale, right? Because even in Pittsburgh, a considerably cheaper place to live than New York, there are places in, there are places in Pittsburgh in the, the artsy or neighborhoods where there are $2 million homes that I would have been embarrassed to live in when, you know, when I was a poor kid going up in the projects, it's just that they're charging a, a shit ton of money for it because, um, because it's in like our theater district. <laughs> well, well, and, and my, my, neighborhood you know 10 years ago when i moved here this was a dangerous part of town gentrification has taken hold and there are apartments a half a block from me so and and maron you're gonna laugh but you know apartments here selling you know, two three thousand dollars a month rent which is crazy mm-hmm. in pittsburgh for, i mean yeah, yeah it's, for, it's for, crazy for a neighborhood that crazy 10 years ago that- you, for a neighborhood <laughs> that 10 years ago you were afraid to drive through you know Yes. And it's crazy in that my, in that my, you know, comparing like I know where that area, I know where Wayne lives and I know what houses he's talking about that rent for three thousand dollars a month. And that is four times my mortgage. <laughs> you know? yeah, like I'm like, right. what are yeah. you insane? <laughs> like now, but are, that's just are we how it is. talk about the the home as experience or material or both. Mm-hmm. I think it's both, but I think I, I think what I'm arguing is I think maybe the dichotomy that this article argues the experience versus uh, uh, the experience versus consumer. I think, I think that's almost sort of an artificial dichotomy, right? Like, yes, I, agree. I think it's a false construct. Yeah. I think there are some things that are more tangible in that the product that you're buying comes with more physical atoms, you know, like, I mean, literally in a physics kind of sense, like mm-hmm. I, I used to buy music or, uh, you know, and I got for every 12 songs, I got a, you know, a little disc, right? Like that was a physical thing that I was buying comic books. I get a physical book. I get a physical DVD. I get, you know, those are things. Uh, but like I I was always really buying the experience of listening to the song. I was buying the experience of, of reading, of reading the story. That was always really what I was buying. Mm-hmm. And I think that like, I am on, I have always gone on vacation which I paid a lot of money for, but you come back with some memento, even if you're not like, you know, like there are people who will literally just go places, not take a single picture, not buy a single thing. It's just that I, you know, I have been to Tibet and now I'm here and I look around and then I go home. Like that is a thing. And if you're into that, fine, but that's you making a choice. I think for the vast majority of people, it's always been, I'm buying an experience that comes with some tangible, you know, you know, product, or I'm buying a tangible product that comes with some, with, with some experience, right? Like nobody just buy. Well, that's not true. Um, but I think rarely do you buy something like if I buy art for my home, like, yes, I'm buying a physical status symbol of here is my Picasso, which I don't have a Picasso because I can't afford one. But, um, but if I, you know, I'm buying, I'm buying a piece of art that is a tangible thing, but presumably I also on some level like looking at it. I think the distinction that is what is being, where the status is being conferred from, right? Like, yes, yes on some level, on some level, yeah, you buy a CD for the experience of having the CD, but like there is status from the physical owning of something. Whereas now I think the status is, is much more leans heavily towards the experience. Like when we're talking about like, people spending exorbitant amounts of money to live in like tiny apartments, like the location and like the experience that location confirms is where the status is coming from. And, or even like, like when I think of this whole like millennial thing, it's, I think it's most codified in like the fire festival disaster. Just in, <laughs> like, 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 yes. If you saw the, like, like he was selling, staying at a villa for $20,000 a night. Right. Mm-hmm. That didn't even, that wasn't even staffed. Like, so the, which 
so the idea is like the the status of being able to say like of all these incredibly stupid rich people i am <laughs> in my own even richer and far more stupid but so it's like there i think there's the status comes from like being able to say you were in this bigger cooler place rather than like any tan Mm -hmm. you take away because you there was nothing to take away from that experience like yeah yeah, pictures are like a thing but like and i think also experiences most of the people who are talking about having these high status experiences are already in the material place where that's icing on the cake. Because I think like there's uh, in in fitness, they talk about how running is cheap, but marathoning is expensive. <laughs> yes. And, mm. and like that's something that is absolutely true. Because to just go running, you don't need a whole lot. But when you start getting mm-hmm. to the point where you're going to have the experience of the marathon, like that's a halftime job. And people do marathons for all kinds of reasons. But a marathon is a pretty big dedication of time and capital. And you definitely need the resources to be having that much leisure time because it becomes a halftime job when you train for one. And then the and some of that training involves buying gear for all weather, depending on where you live. And people travel extensively for these things. And that's expensive and requires expensive gear. And mm-hmm. that's not the same as I'm going to run a few miles. And and towards what end and like i've done one it was fun it was worth it i don't know that i need to do one again but (laughs) it was a huge huge expense and some other experiences they're just very expensive are climbing mount everest has Mm -hmm. become a really interesting phenomenon where they say that people are dying of exposure while they're waiting for their chance to summit (laughs) and it's just this line of people who paid money for all this equipment and whatever training and they get to the summit and they take their picture and they come back down and there was also an article i read about like the, the peak of everest has an issue around human excrement which mm-hmm. what the fuck and <laughs> what is that if not an experience of yeah. i climbed yeah. mount everest and mm-hmm. is that a materialistic is that materialistic or is that experiential it's definitely experiential but there had to be a materialist critical mass to be able to get there i was talking earlier before we went on about jack kerouac on the road which is this yes sacred book of the beat movement mm-hmm. when they did it it was incredibly cheap and it's based on actual experience and every now and again the journalist will do an article about what would it cost to recreate that trip today. Mm -hmm. And it's expensive if you try to do that now, Mm -hmm. because you can't really hitchhike. You can't stay at these little YMCA hotels and to do an on the road style trip, which I think also it's a bigger conversation about privilege because these were two white guys who did that, Mm -hmm. who I don't think minorities could have pulled that off. Which is part of the book, by the way. Like, yeah. 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 That's a sign that there, there had to be a certain material infrastructure to allow that. And if it was today, it would be its own Instagram. I think channel. that points to something interesting, though, because if you're talking about that book, you know, like we're talking about things as though millennials invented experience culture. The entire point of On the Road, you're right. It is about privilege. It is about, you know, point part of the book is that they can afford to do this because they are they have a privilege the minorities in the book do not have the ability to just travel around they are struggling and what it really points to is that millennials didn't really invent this experience culture thing it's a youth culture issue that you know that happened at that point on the roads written 1957 and and we're talking about the beat generation which the entire point of the beat generation in popular media at the time is that fuck these young kids who don't want to get a job it was a bunch of old men yelling at young people about avocado toast that's what the beats were (laughs) and it it really was and and throughout the hippie thing as well i mean they Mm -hmm. they referred to things things as an experience uh, happening Mm -hmm. right uh woodstock woodstock is what 
Woodstock is the fire festival, but it worked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, kind of. <laughs> and that's a thing. Like we have, like, we've always had these experiences. I, I was thinking like the most materialistic thing I can think of, for instance, is like buying a Ferrari, right. Or some, or a Lamborghini or some ultra expensive sports car. But like, really that's entirely an expense. It, it, you know, sure. Maybe your car can drive 300 miles an hour, but you never actually do. Right. Like you're like, you're like driving your Honda Civic is just as good for the utility of owning a car as driving a Ferrari. You're just buying an experience with the Ferrari. That's all it it really is. It's a, it's just status, right? Well, yeah. If you buy the Ferrari, then you have to make a trip and ship it to the Audubon so you can actually drive 300 miles an hour. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yes. I guess because you're not doing anything with it in the States other than it's, I mean, that's not to say if, you know, if Ferrari is listening and they want to sponsor us and give me one, I am happy to accept. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure that will happen. Sure. Um, I, I, we're, we're closing, we're closing in on our our time here. I do want to mention, and this, at this point, it's, it's more of a footnote. I do just want to throw it in observationally. The, the whole buying stuff versus experiencing stuff from the, the retail point of view, I, you know, in certainly in my industry, the, the comics world, uh, just the lack of sales, something I've seen time and time again is our old customers. People have been doing this for years, buying lots and lots of comics. The number of conversations I've had with people who say, how can I get rid of 20 long boxes? I don't have room anymore. And it's <laughs> stuff, you know, so they've been buying this for years. They've accumulated the stuff. It's the experience of reading it, but now they have it and they're out of room for it and nobody wants it. And I just, I, I, I don't know that that whole, from a retail point of view, does it make more sense to have a store where inventory is required, where as a retailer, you have to restock every week and get new stuff in? Or should I set up an axe throwing business where I buy six <laughs> axes and once a month go down and replace the two by fours at Lowe's <laughs> where there's no overhead? You're, you're selling, hey, come here and throw axes. Mm-hmm. You know what's ironic though is like Amazon is branching into so there's this weird thing where it's like now I mean now they have like this sort of algorithm based stocking uh, where they only like will stock books that are like performing well on their website and so the mm-hmm. very focused way of like doing a store but they're not I don't think like I think they're still I think people are still interested in going and buying things I just think now they have to feel exceptional or they have to like have reached some sort of threshold before you know like if everyone's talking about like one book then people will actually go out to buy it mm-hmm. but now don't just like thumb through and randomly pick books it's just the first of- time I, I ran into that I was at a, a Borders a friend of mine was working there he had run a comic shop years ago and every time I was there, I noticed I didn't need these, but you know, Neil Gaiman Sandman series, there are 10 volumes in, in the series. And anytime I went there, they would have volumes one, four, six, and nine, and not the rest of them. And it was exactly that based on their algorithms. Those are the ones that sold more. So they didn't actually keep the entire series in stock all the time, which I can't just imagine reading that series me. that way. <laughs> that just baffled me. Even though it was a series to be read in order, they didn't stock the entire series because of sales numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's funny. What they're and that's a way of the articles are coming out about uh, independent bookstores making a comeback. Yeah, in recent years. So I wonder how much of that is them filling the niche and picking up the slack of the 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 rest of that series for example yeah, we've seen some of that here in pittsburgh i know there are several 15 years ago there really were no independent bookstores left now there are four a, or five yeah, that I can go to. Of them. yeah there's yeah this really, this really good book called i can't remember who it's by it's called the revenge of analog and it it discusses it kind of touches on this uh, about like how the return to the return to certain things like independent bookstores or vinyl or like handmade watches and all that stuff is uh is sort of like the reaction like there's a swing back outside outside of the culture a culture that sort of narrows people like the, the algorithm culture is really based on the idea that people's preferences are very much the same as Latin mm. people and so there is a swing outside of that but I think the problem with it is those tend to be more expensive you know like independent booksellers in my experience the books are just slightly more expensive because mm. you know they're, they, they don't have the, a whole 
national chain to allow them yeah, to. You, you can't discount it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You can't discount um, it and pay your rent. Exactly. Um, so the problem is like, even if these things are coming back, are they coming back uh, in a sustainable uh-huh. way? You know, like it used to be. Or. There used to be so many, there's so many uh, independent bookstores and, you know, they were a little bit less expensive, but now it's kind of like to be an individual, you have to be like richer and like have. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm seeing to that point, I'm seeing a really big resurgence of interest in watches Mm -hmm. because the, the, the Apple watch has become ubiquitous Mm -hmm. and I'm seeing ads in subways for Swiss watches. And, I, and there was that article that's been, that has circulated recently about how the Apple watch has outsold the entire Swiss watch industry. Mm-hmm. And that is such a data insufficiency problem because Shake Shack outsells Peter Luger, but Shake Shack is not a threat to Peter Luger. Mm-hmm. And so like, a, like the people who are buying Apple watches are not buying Apple watches at the expense of Rolex and Omega and Panerai. They're buying it at the expense of Casio and Fossil. Mm -hmm. And then people have some of the other people I've spoken to about, about that particular niche. They got sick of looking at one more screen, but got used to something on their wrist. And that became something that is much more status oriented, that is much more individualized. And to Io's point, you have to have money to have that individualized experience because mm. those ain't cheap. Exactly. Yeah. Like there's a sense that like uh, it, it's, it's it, it, I think I still think status is as, as a central part of this like entire discussion. And now yes. the things are, it, it's very status based to be able to afford like a time piece as they're called, you know? Yeah. So we've resolved nothing. Nope. And we never will. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed the experience. <laughs> I don't know. It's I mean, it's weird though. I mean, like I think we have like more so than normal. We've resolved something because I think we really have figured out that, like Marone and I were saying, it's not so much a war between experience and materialism so mm-hmm. much as I think that they were always tied together. There's and been some things, yes. yeah, and some things might float a little more to the left, and some things might float a little more to the right on on the continuum. But they're you know they're still always you know most things are both right like it's an experience running a podcast everybody here is very fond of it but like it's not a free experience i mean like yes part of it's buying hosting part of it's you know but there is a bare minimum amount of equipment that you have to buy in order to do it and you can depending on what you want and sound quality, there is no end to the amount of money you can spend on microphones. I assure you, (laughs) You like there's so much that you can do here. So I I think it's always doing both. I think, I think you're always, you know, what good, what good is stuff if it can't give you an experience of enjoying it and what, so, so it's always been experience, but what good is an experience if you, you know, if you forget you have it, right? Right. So I don't know. (laughs) You're right. Maybe we were off nothing <laughs> but i do think it was a good conversation i want to thank both of our guests for joining us yeah thanks thank guys thanks my pleasure right. yeah. um well if people i mean since you're I, I guess you're both future podcasters more than anything else but like do you have anything to plug so far uh so i am developing two right now through the fellowship one is i'm calling it slippery slope it's a near future dystopia Uh, audio drama. And the other I have yet to name, but I'm working with a colleague from my firm to do a consumer education piece on real estate. And the audio podcast fellows for people who are in New York, we are doing an open house on Thursday, March 12th, 6 to 8 p.m. I sent you the link, so it's going to be in the show notes. And that is something you can RSVP to and learn more if you want to join our join our program next year. And you can also find me at maronloxner.com. Uh, Aya, what about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, my, my podcast is not out yet, but it is tentatively titled, I think I read this somewhere. And it's a show that puts together the ideas we learned in our news, see on our news feed from, with the ideas we learned classroom so it's 
it's coming. It's getting there. Hopefully it'll be out in the next couple of months, but I do want to re-up what Marone said. Definitely check out um, the audio podcast fellows. It's a really great program and they're starting their application season. So if you're in the New York area, you should do it. And you can find me at um, iooosobamiro.com. That's spelled I-O-A-Y-O and then last name O-S-O, B for boy, A-M for Mary, I-R-O dot com. All my stuff is there. And that'll be linked in the show notes. Yes, it will be. Uh, what about you, Wayne? I have nothing new this week. <laughs> no. Yeah, we're doing. You had a I, pretty I, good streak I, going for a bit there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I might even. I have a couple things I'm working on that just I'm not quite there yet in terms of linking to them, or they're just not available yet. But you, we'll see. Um, yeah, you'll be back on the show. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll probably be back. <laughs> um, and you can follow me on Twitter at Chris Maverick or on my own website at chrismaverick.com. You can follow the show on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, all the places at Vox Popcast. You can follow the show's blog at www.voxpopcast.com where you can find out about what we're talking about next week and the week after that and the week after that. You can leave us comments. We can try to address them on the show. You can leave us suggestions. And if you enjoy the show, and we certainly hope you do, then we would like it if you'd subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever the hell else you get podcasts from. And do us a favor. Leave us a five-star review, especially on iTunes, on Apple Podcasts. That helps other people people find the show especially if you're really really nice and you you know write a little review write a little something something then we will read it out loud on the show and that's an experience that you can enjoy we certainly will it will so, cost you nothing it cost you nothing nothing except for a few strokes of your fingertips it's just it, and you know that's a deal <laughs> so we would appreciate it if you do that I would like to thank Maximilian of thought form music for our epic theme song building ever so more epically and playing us out i'd like to once again thank both of our guests for joining us i'd like to thank you for listening and we'll see you next time bye bye all right remember to keep your hands clear of the cable and just let your equipment do the work now when you're about halfway down the zip line the camera's going to take your picture so when I call out, shaka bra, look up and give the camera a nice shaka bra. All right, you ready? Yeah. Ready to do some zipping? Yeah. All right, let's hear you say zip line. Zip line. Shaka bra. <laughs> Woohoo! All right, nice zip. Well, how was it, Carbon? Totally fucking stupid, dude. Oh, really? Yeah, dude, it's fucking boring as shit.